Go ahead. You're on. Hello, everyone. My name is Navid Garamani. Today, I'm presenting to you a clinical case presentation on atheroembolism, a major differential diagnosis for acute neurological emergencies requiring highly skilled approach to the diagnosis and a robust team effort to resuscitate the subject patient. Together, let's visit the emergency room for a visual exercise. Eight-year-old male. Onset time at this point is about 45 minutes. Hi, John. Don't worry. We're going to look after you. Can you smile for me? Have a look at my nose. How many fingers do you see moving? One. Can you point to it? They're ready for us down in CT. What I've seen in the years of being an emergency physician is tremendous excitement in the ability to treat stroke, but they're all very time sensitive. As we can see, as we can see, um, uh, 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 preliminary observations and diagnosis. Um, preliminary observations and diagnosis. Atheroembolism is a very time sensitive uh, matter. Um, uh, atheroembolism has a major probability uh, to threat, uh, that threats the CNS livelihood. Um, we can Preliminary, uh, so, so we can tell uh, that uh, atheroembolism uh, is a major cause for uh, neuronal death. There is 2 million neurons that can be compromised for every minute of ischemia. Now, or every atheroembolism event uh, possibility for a CNS uh, uh, event or not, that is the question. Let's examine our first clinical case. On August 26 at 8.47 a.m., 62-year-old Caucasian male with chief complaint of vision, loss, vision loss, and a painful blue toes present to the emergency department of the Cab Medical Center, Atlanta. Mr. Aubrey states that two days ago at 8.15 a.m. while working in his garden, he experienced vision changes that was described as mixed blindness and blurriness in the right eye and lasted one minute. Normal vision was restored after he washed his face with cold water. No medical intervention or medications were used to help restoring the vision. However, he expresses severe anxiety and fear of total loss of vision at the time. In addition, last night he experiences blue discoloration of his toes concomitant with mild nausea and abdominal pain while watching TV laying on his recliner. Soaking his feet in warm water did not help, nor taking ibuprofen or Plavix. Feeling of abdominal pain was tolerated and did not become a concern. Now, throughout this case, uh, I'm going to analyze what are the uh, phenomena that can contribute to our understanding as physicians in order to rule in and rule out um, the diagnosis that goes towards atheroembolism or similar cases, and whether it is involved CNS or it's not involving CNS. So from the past medical history, our patient has peripheral arterial disease and diabetes mellitus type two and hypercholesterolemia. Um, those are significant. From the surgical history, there's coronary angiogram on August 18 at Emory Hospital. Um, Hospitalization history on August 17 was admitted for percutaneous coronary intervention at Emory Hospital. Um, from medications, there's plenty of medications for um, cardiac conditions. Social history, he lives with uh, his 40-year-old uh, girlfriend, admits to 20 pack of year smoking tobacco, quit 15 years ago, 12 bottles of Heineken weekly, and a shot of Jägermeister at night. Familial history is uh, significant for familial hypercholesterolemia from the father's side. From review of system, um, it is very important for us to know that in order to diagnose, we need to see positive pertinent sign 
and negative pertinent symptoms. Um, not always we look for positive symptoms. We sometimes diagnose rule in and rule out conditions based on negative pertinent symptoms. So for now, uh, our patient is anxious with sensation of pain and pressure for out of five in both feet, denies loss of vision, fever, dizziness, palpitation, chest pain, shortness of breath, and nausea and vomit. Denies ability to walk due to edema and discomfort of both feet. Denies any injury to trauma to the toes of either side. Denies drugs of abuse, admits to the unprotected sex with other women. Um, on the assessment modality, uh, we can tell that vital signs are slightly elevated from general appearance. We have a 62-year-old elderly gentleman, reasonably groomed, in clean clothes, awake, alert, anxious, moderate pain and discomfort, wearing open toe sandals, sitting on a wheelchair, communicating his symptoms with the emergency doctor with no speech difficulties. Now, we need to have appropriate neurological uh, examination for this case. This, uh, when the patient expressed a partial loss of vision and blue toe discolorations, um, these are can be neurological examination. So a neuro, a good neuro examination would come to place. We have found that he, on the neurological examination, is oriented times three. Um, uh, Glasgow coma scale was 15, and what is pertinent here on the fundoscopy. He has Hollenhorst plaque. I'm going to discuss what Hollenhorst plaque is. Hollenhorst plaques are uh, somewhat specific findings for atheroembolism. Cranial nerves are uh, intact. Upper motor neurons are strength of five, five, five out of five. Um, what is also pertinent uh, is that what is a pertinent negative finding here is Babinski. Uh, now, finger to nose. Uh, within normal limit. And also, uh, we have a speech uh, understanding of the patient. The speech is intact, negative dysprotosia, negative dysarthria, negative aphasia, and negative dysphagia. So these sequelae of negative findings in neurological examination actually help us understand that this may not be a... Um, yeah, well, I don't have to pass it to microwave. This may not be a. Um, it's okay. For Monday. It's okay. May not be a CNS involved uh, type of lesion at this point. Now, on physical examination, we have cardio, S1, S2, audible, but what is pertinent finding is S3 Gallup, grade one out of five. Uh, memories were uh, negative, uh, regular rhythm, uh, regular rate. Uh, the rhythm was uh, defective with uh, S3 gallop. Uh, none descended PMI. Lungs were within normal limits. GI generally was normal. However, he had some abdominal complaint and it was found that he has palpitation. Pa on palpation, it elicited three out of five diffuse colicky pain without rebound. There was a constipation as well. HENT was within normal limit. GU was deferred. And on musculoskeletal, um, we have a bilateral pedal edema, four out of five, without sign of a skin abrasions or deep cuts. Positive for bilateral rubber of ankle skin, intact, active, and passive range of motion per bilateral ankles and toes. Walking was deferred, Romberg negative. Now, when we have Romberg negative, when we have Glasgow coma scale of 15, when we have a patient that's sitting and communicating his sick uh, symptoms, even though he has a reported that he had a transient vision loss, it may not necessarily be a atheroembolism to the CNS system. Now we have to further investigate. Now, what would be our clinical hunch and differential diagnosis in this case? Now, an embolic, we have an embolic condition suited for elderly gentlemen at this time with this presentation would uh, be atheroembolism with acute kidney injury, um, and amaurosis fugax also fits into the description of vision loss and restoration of vision with no medical intervention. A stroke, abdominal angina, acute mesenteric ischemia, possibly due to the date and time, COVID-19 hypercoagulability state uh, could also fit into this case. However, for, um, however, for something such as fat emboli syndrome, it requires history of bone fracture. He didn't have bone fracture. Uh, for in infective endocarditis with embolization, 
It requires fever and a numer on fever and a new murmur. On physical examination, he did not have fever and there was no new murmur. Uh, Antiphospholipid anti syndrome, although it's a hypercoagulability state, it usually applies to pregnancy. Certainly doesn't apply to our um, elderly gentleman. Um, so I went ahead and I wrote a workup to further investigate. And here's the workup, CBC, CMP, BO, and creatinine. Um, the pertinent workups, also a following imaging, we have carotid Doppler, phonoscopy, and I'm going to analyze the result of each result from this point on. Um, so let's take a look at the result and let's analyze the result together. If we have a hunch on atheroembolism, that is mobilization of, um, uh, that is mobilization of cholesterol, it's also called cholesterol emboli. Um, there is a significant understanding in medicine that if there is elevated eosinophilia and uh, elevated eosinophilia is a positive uh, finding for this case. Um, also, we have serum creatinine was three, which signifies that he has acute kidney injury, uh, could possibly be an embolization to the renal arteries. Um, uh, and, and so there are two important findings here, eosinophilia and a low serum C3 level. Low complementimania and elevated eosinophilia are a specific diagnostic findings for atheroembolism event. Now, is this atheroembolism necessarily a CNS, uh, threatening CNS? Not at this point, because he had um, on uh, Glasgow Coma Scale, he was 15, and uh, we will examine that more. Let's look at your analysis. Your analysis is within normal. The CMP came within normal. The MRI of the brain that I wrote, it was found to be within normal. Abdominal CT angiogram was inconclusive within normal. Renal ultrasound found left renal enlargement, and SARS COVID 19 RNA testing was also negative. Um, so from the negative pertinent findings, we are more narrowing down the diagnosis was atheroembolism. The ECG was found to have deep Q waves with T wave inversion, which fits in to the history of the patient that he was admitted for percutaneous coronary intervention um, about a week ago, and he may have suffered uh, congestive heart failure in time. There was a TM flow study done with right leg, 60% uh, patent and left, uh, left uh, arterial vessels for the left side with only 0.55, uh, per, uh, with 55% patent, which is not normal. It is subsufficient. And chest X-ray was within normal without mediastinal shift. Now, here's a CMP. Everything was within normal. There was a slight uh, uh, chloride deficiency. We can look past that. Now let's examine what Hollenhorst plaque is. Hollenhorst plaque is a specific finding in atheroembolism that rules in the diagnosis of atheroembolism. This plaque is often uh, taken from the carotid artery and it finds itself any branch that fits its size. Now at this point I would like to examine um, we are going to take a look at the 3D model of the brain vasculature. And in this 3D model, I will explain how we have uh, a Hollenhorst plaque forming. A formation of Hollenhorst plaque uh, it can be best understood with this uh, imagery. Now we have a 3D model of the brain. Uh, these are the vasculatures of the brain. I can, I can move the uh, model to my willing. This is the anterior cut sagittal of the brain. Um, here we have, I can bring the model forward. Here we have 21, it's called internal carotid artery. Now we have two conditions, amaurosis fugax and amaurosis. Um, amaurosis fugax was the one that a plaque within the internal carotid artery was dislodged and the vision was slightly affected, but it was restored. And then there is another condition that is um, that that causes blindness, and that is when uh, the uh, anterior retinal artery is blocked. So let's follow this diagram and find where we are. 
this is this is the internal carotid artery. Let's go to 22. This is the internal carotid artery um, calendula. Uh, this is this is pretty much uh, um, this is a still internal carotid artery. If I come to the right, I have ophthalmic artery. Now I would like for you to look at the bifurcation. The bifurcation has two characteristics. It is substantially narrow on this bifurcation, and it is also has, has a very sharp turn coming towards, uh, coming towards uh, lacrimal artery and coming towards ophthalmic artery. Now, the, the Hollenhorst plaque, if Hollenhorst plaque was obstructing it at 24, it would have caused a complete vision loss which would be amaurosis. Amaurosis in Greek means darkness. However, amaurosis fugax means transient darkness. Now, the plaque that we observed in our patient moved through this, this branch and it further moved through 25, which is a lacrimal artery. Um, at, at, okay, at, at this bifurcation, not lacrimal artery, at this bifurcation and passed to ciliary artery. So this is at the level of ciliary artery. If at ciliary, at the, at the point of 25, uh, uh, the plaque form, we would have complete vision loss, but we do not have complete vision loss. So what is Hollenhorst plaque? The Hollenhorst plaque moves to the end branches of ciliary artery. Now I'm going to show you. So one more time, let's let's take a look. Um, here is here is a complete. Um, let's take a look at the big picture here. So here's a brain. Um, yes. So from the. So if the uh, uh, if the emboli move through a carotid, it will go through one bifurcation here that is very narrow and has a sharp turn. It could cause blindness, but our patient did not experience complete blindness. It, it, he, he had transient. So the, so the emboli moved much further ahead that would be distal. So let's go back and examine what is going on with our patient. So this, this way of finding uh, helps us understand that this is not a CNS, a stroke. This is a, um, a, a this is an atheroemboli that did not end in complete vision loss. So amaurosis fugax is a carotid artery embolization that goes down the stream and cause uh, ischemia, transient darkness with revival of the vision less than two minutes. However, anterior ophthalmic artery vision loss would be a complete amaurosis. Now, Another on physical examination, there is another important physical examination, and that is a negative relative pupillary defect. On physical examination, we found out that our patient was negative on relative pupillary defect. Now, I would like for us to examine what is negative pupillary defect. Negative pupillary defect is described this way. The light is shined now is on the left eye. The right eye responds. The left eye responds. Now, one more time. The right eye responds. The left eye doesn't respond. Now, the, the left eye doesn't respond again. And the right eye causes bilateral pupil constriction. So as a physician, on the emergency room, you can go ahead and perform relative pupillary defect to simply differentiate. If your patient truly has amaurosis fugax or he has actually has a uh, amaurosis, which is a complete obstruction of um, the uh, central retinal artery. So one more time, just to recap. If it was positive for relative pupillary defect, it would be central retinal artery occlusion. If it was negative for pupillary effect and the vision was restored, it would be amaurosis fugax. Now let's take a look in here just to recap. The elaborate uh, perfusion map of the brain combined with the highly specialized homunculus of the brain's function has become the diagnostic guide based on the symptoms. Uh, and we have CT and MRI. So if you as a physician 
were asking me, why don't you consider the patient's complaint of vision loss to be a central retinal artery occlusion? Well, on the fondoscopy of the patient, which we had, let's look at his fondoscopy one more time. This is his fondoscopy. On this fondoscopy, he, he's showing Hollenhorst, and he does not show signs and symptoms of uh, cherry red uh, macula or cherry spot with the central retinal artery occlusion and or um, the edematous mm -hmm. and pallor of the central retinal vein. Um, so there are plenty of syndromes that we all know, anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, and they all produce a specific uh, CNS and nervous system symptoms based on the homunculus of the brain. However, with our patient, we focus on ophthalmic artery versus uh, the amaurosis fugax syndrome, which we are honing down into amaurosis fugax more and more. Now, our patient also had a uh, EKG done. On the EKG, uh, this is the result of the EKG of the patient. We can see deep Q waves. So let me clarify. This is deep Q waves. That just tells me as a physician that my patient has experienced old uh, myocardial infarctions and there was some CHF. Well, for that reason, he was also uh, was admitted for a stent placement and percutaneous coronary intervention. And that just confirms that uh, our patient has had some congestive heart failure and he has suffered from that. So that is great. Now from Glasgow Coma Scale, how did I uh, score my patient with Glasgow Coma Scale of 15, even though he has atheroembolism? Well, from the general appearance description of the patient, uh, we can we can escort the patient. He's a 62-year-old elderly gentleman, reasonably groomed, communicate his symptoms, he's verbal, and that just helps me to score him four for eye opening, five for best verbal response, and six for best motor response. So this is one of the negative pertinent findings that tells me we are not having a CNS, a stroke at this moment. Now, let's go ahead and just to understand, a atheroembolism has certain requirements. For atheroembolism, generally, your patient should be greater than 50 years old. There is dermatological findings. There could be levido reticularis. We didn't have that. We have syndrome that we had on this patient. Acute kidney injury with uh, creatinine up to three, which was found on this patient. And amaurosis fugax on CNS. So having a sequelae of uh, symptoms would help us uh, hone down into understanding an atheroemboli that didn't produce major severe CNS symptoms. However, there is an atheroemboli. Um, let's recall having eosinophilia with reduced complementomania, complement also helps to understand. Um, the surgical history is fits uh, the protocol. There's percutaneous PCI. And the time of proximity should be within uh, the past several months or the past uh, procedures. Now, uh, I have to, as a physician, be able to prove my diagnosis. So I would look into a history finding versus physical examination. From physical examination to prove that there was atheroembolism, uh, Glasgow coma scale was 15. Um, therefore, this was not CNS related. However, he has Hollenhorst plaque. He has reduced serum C3 level, and he has 12% eosinophilia. These three findings are highly, highly sensitive and specific to understand that there is a, a plaque embolization. Now, let's look at the uh, management drill of our patient if he had a CNS symptoms. I'm in here. All right, doc, we got a 77 year old male who was at the pharmacy this morning getting his medication. Witness Ready, one, states two, three. about 735. She noticed him having left-sided weakness and facial droop and slurred speech. Blood glucose was uh, 94. Johnson, I'm Dr. Okay. Lee. And onset was 735. I'm going to be taking care of you, okay? Thank you. Thanks for the call. I want you to appreciate do it. a couple things for me. How many fingers do you see? One. Good. How many? Two. Good. How about this arm? I'm going to hold it up there. Okay, ready? One. Okay, good. Ready to scan? Yep. Please notice the time elapsed. We're going to do another direction. picture of your brain, sir, okay? One right, one. Okay, okay. Why, why don't we call upstairs? I'll tell the endovascular suite that we have a go. We're getting ready to do a procedure to actually remove the blood clot from the brain that's causing your symptoms, okay? okay I'm in the artery. 
All right, I'm set up to do a run there. Do some angiography. Okay, there is a right MCA occlusion, just as we saw in the CTA, so we're gonna proceed with pulling the clot out. Okay, let's do a run there, another angiograph clot. Excellent. It looks like we've opened up the right middle cerebral artery. Let's look at the pre-images. So there's the occlusion. Looks like everything is open again. Great. All right, sir, I'm just going to unstrap you here for a second. I just want to see, uh, can you raise your right arm off the table? Excellent. How about your left one? Hey, that's great. Can you, uh, can you smile really big for me? Excellent, that looks better than it did when you came in, okay? We're able to get the blood clot out and you're already showing some signs of improvement. So I'm hopeful this means you'll have a good recovery. Wonderful. Um, as we can see, uh, the patient, uh, signs of improvement and that is incredible modality of treatment. But did our patient have CNS involvement? No, he did not have. Because a simple, first of all, we did MRI, the MRI result was negative. And also um, simple clinical examination, physical examination can rule out the CNS involvement. Now, uh, we discussed this one. Now, it generally, the management of atheroembolism, there is no specific therapy for cholesterol emboli. Um, to your surprise, you can admit and do supportive therapy IV saline, aspirin, Flavix, matters that help the arterial uh, obstruction. You can stabilize based on the Glasgow Coma scale. Not everyone will come perfectly with Glasgow Coma scale of 15 our patient. Um, therefore, we can move accordingly. There is reperfusion for ischemic uh, stroke or revascularization for lower extremities for our patient, actually. Um, but you can, you can have the patient admit it Stay on it for one night and examine the legs and see how the rubor, dolor, and calor of bilateral pedal edema, do they resolve on their own? And then we can move into an angiography for the lower extremity vascular. But you can take your time and you can, uh, you can uh, understand and study the patient a bit more methodical. It doesn't have to be um, very immediate because brain was not involved. Uh, both from the MRI and both from uh, clinical examination. Now, you can do supportive therapy um, and also to, to, per, to protect and prevent end organ damage. And uh, we discussed coronary artery disease and uh, uh, preventions. Now, in general, uh, lifestyle modifications, what is recommended to not to enter a state like that, to have atheroembolism or atherosclerosis, um, uh, there are six food items that is understood and nutritionists recommend. Uh, cinnamon, uh, red wine, uh, salmon, uh, avocado, and red pepper, and turmeric and garlic are uh, well known for both anti-inflammatory and also they have blood thinning effect, meaning anticoagulopathy effects, that if these uh, six food items, or seven with the avocado on the side, uh, be included in your diet is a great addition to your diet. Now, um, there are cuisines that uh, very, uh, very frequently um, take advantage of the spices. So we have Persians, Hindi, Mediterranean, Latin spicy cuisines that are well known for uh, spices with anticoagulation uh, benefits. Um, so, and also in the end, exercise reduces inflammation. And um, I, let me uh, get back to this one. So these, uh, the, uh, the various cultures use uh, the items that, for example, the turmeric or the garlic and red pepper are commonly used in the following cuisines, uh, both for uh, flavor and faint of heart. Uh, and also it is uh, very, very healthy. Um, uh, so exercise reduces inflammation, and inflammation is known to be a nidus for atheromas. Um, 
I, uh, I, I recommend uh, participating in aquatics or uh, skiing or also uh, sports like Tai Chi, yoga, meditation, Kundalini, uh, sports that are aerobic help reduce inflammation and help uh, alleviate uh, conditions that prevent entering, uh, causing atherosclerosis or atheroma and or atheroembolism in the end. Also preventing um, not smoking cigarette is a major uh, importance. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate um, your participation in this um, presentation. Thank you, Dr. Stein. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navid.